Women, Work and the Art of Subway by Mireille Giuliano Savoir know how literally knowing how to do competence experience the ready knowledge of the right course of action knowing what to do and say and when and how to do so overture Speaking to an audience of 2,500 women in a Boston ballroom at what was billed as a premier leadership conference for women in business, I said, so here's a question for you, excluding family members and not counting peers you go for routine help, do you have a senior person in business who consistently offers you sound counsel and support? and who champions you. In short, is there a person you've had or have who is your mentor? Raise your hand if you have someone. Perhaps 15% of the women raise their hands. Okay, new question. Raise your hand if you like chocolate. Easily 80% of the women shot up hands. Scientific? No. Telling? Women may share a lot of things, like a love for chocolate, but having a strong mentor isn't one of them. We all need a special someone or two we can ask questions of and to turn to for help. Someone we can count on to extend him or herself for us. I know I do, yes. And I wish I'd had suitably informed people to turn to as my professional life, even people who could speak with me via the printed page. I've written this book partly in response to the remarkable number of women who came up to me after I spoke at a conference or business school, or who emailed me from all around the world after reading one of, or both, of my French women books, asking me to write just this sort of book from my large perspective and my own style. As I wrote it, I found myself thinking about the scores of women who have sat across from me in job interviews, those who have worked for me and with me over the years, the people I have worked for, some good, some not so good. And I thought about the things I wanted to say to them at the time, but couldn't because it wasn't quite appropriate. Now's my chance. What I can tell you share reader it's what i wanted to tell all those women over the years whether it's about how best to present yourself to a future employer how to balance the demands of work and life or how to relax and enjoy yourself even when you're feeling the pressure of too many demands and not enough time a healthy balance of work life with life life Certainly an imperative amid the pressures of certainly an imperative amid the pressures of personal responsibilities and gratifications and the still emerging class of business challenges, expectations and pressures. What's the point of being a successful businesswoman if you are not happy and are suffering a messy and unhealthy personal life? Someone said I should call this book French Women Don't Get Fired. The problem, though, is they do get fired. And I couldn't possibly deliver a fail-safe recipe for holding on to your job. What I have tried to write is the sort of book I wish I had been given when starting out in the working world and had at hand along the way. This isn't another business book that tells you how to succeed or get the corner office. Yes, of course, you'll find advice on getting ahead and getting promoted. But more than that, you'll find advice on being happy and living a good life, even while you are making the biggest contribution you can to the workplace. That's why I dare to talk about style and clothes and food and wine 
and entertaining and life in a business book. We don't work in a vacuum. Our work is part of the rest of our lives. I want to emphasize that you can work smarter and healthier than a lot of people and you can reap the benefits. That's one form of savoir I remember my first meaningful job in New York in public relations. I had no training or real experience in I was a trained translator interpreter. I did not think I was qualified for the PR position, but the classified ad in the New York Times described what seemed like such a dream job for me that I applied anyway. But so did 30 others. That I got the job was a wonder to me and like a lot of people starting a new job, really a new stage in life and career, I was a bit scared that I might not be up to the challenge. It turned out that I was. And at my three month review, I had grown the courage to ask my boss why he had chosen me of all those people with stronger PR experience and backgrounds. I could not even write a press release, I said, still full of wonder. Mary A, anyone can learn how to write a press release, he answered. Your general knowledge, enthusiasm and language skills set you apart from the others. We are who we are, but we can learn new things all the time, evolve over time, by working hard and smart and realise our potential. Plus others, like my clairvoyant PR boss, can see talent and potential in us that sometimes we can't see for ourselves. I learned through my two best-selling French women books that if I share my experiences and highlight some of the lessons I've learned, I, I can have a helpful influence on people who are eager for a little coaching and wish to join a community of like-minded women. Plus, life experience observed and communicated by a woman to a woman is just not the same thing as getting it from a male perspective, something many businessmen do not yet realise or are helpless to do anything about. Over the course of my career, I went from that PR job to board meetings of multi-million dollar companies held in global capitals where at 8.30am, self-possessed executives lit up their cigars. Noblesse oblige. And hours later, the smoke was still rising, though the quality of this course was not. At one meeting, I vividly recall, I caught a division leader firing up his laptop with pornography. Seeing me, seeing me, seeing him, he said, I need it in the morning to get me going. You could not make this stuff up. Have you noticed that the author of almost any business book whether self-help, textbook, memoir, or biography is usually someone who has never been mistaken for a secretary. Not a surprise, since more than 90% of CEOs and corporate board members are men. Now, I confess that I am the professor of business, management consultant, a new term needs management therapist, or career guru. I am, however, a seemingly accomplished businesswoman with 30 years of perspective on the practice of business in America and internationally, the evolving role of women in business and the global transformations of the marketplace. Plus, I try to be a pilgrim in addressing the cultural exigencies of modern business and life through a balanced and healthy lifestyle. I have certainly had a charmed business life not that I have not been screamed at by drug-addicted megalomaniacs, one, or tolerated some awkward colleagues with reptilian IQs yet soaring egos, but I have been at the table during a strikingly transitional period for women in business and have experienced a meal of small, medium and large business in private and public versions, with even a little government bureaucracy thrown in. Hey. I was born French. One characteristic of my career, and part of why I wrote this book now, which I hope 
will help fill a gap in women-centric communications. Is that is that I write from a global perspective with a footprint? Is that I write from a global perspective with a footprint in three centuries and many countries? Being a French woman and an American citizen, and having worked for a French company, I believe I wear the kind of cross-cultural glasses that help one see some of the obvious characteristics of our working environment that can be lost on us when we are in the middle of it. We lose perspective. The French champagne company I joined in 1984 was still a venerable family-controlled enterprise run by a fading generation of aristocrats. Using 19th century human resource and business practices, though they were very nice people, their awareness of women in business started and ended with perhaps the first modern businesswoman, Dame Clicquot, who was born in 1777 and died in 1866. Overnight, I became the highest ranking woman at Veuve Clicquot. Since Madame Clicquot, one of my lasting secret pleasures was when the chairman of the company, a true gentleman with whom I still visit, Count Alain de Vogue, would absent mindedly call me or refer to me as Madame Clicquot. Two rapid mergers later, the Verve Glicquot group of companies became one of the major components of today's LVMH, the world's largest luxury goods company. That proved to be a business culture changing of no small order. My business world grew up in a hurry from an initial consortium of successful French companies left with considerable independence to today's LVMH, a 21st century global conglomerate. In 1975, Time magazine declared we were entering the year of women. I'd say they printed that story at least a quarter century too soon. Sure, women like me were maturing then with a new sense of identity and opportunity and entering new fields. But the tangible results were a generation away and not just in the corner offices or, and boardrooms. At the time, less than 10% of practicing attorneys and physicians in America were women. Today, the number are near a 30% and climbing. Women still represent less than 20% of the United States Congress. But the real change has been in education, nationally and internationally. For the past two decades in the United States, far more women in the 18 to 24 age group have attended college than ever before. And women now make up the majority of college students. In developed and developing nations alike, the future belongs to the emerging class of female professionals. In some regions of the world, the Middle East among them, daughters and mass are being afforded the opportunity to attain a higher education for the first time and set and a set of careers and career paths important to the global economy are becoming open to women. The lessons learned for women and men during this global transition period in business, government and governance are timely and appropriate for the 21st century. As I have often said, I don't want to live in the past, but learn from the past. What's here is, I hope, timely and contemporary for now, right now. This book, with its personal illustrations, is essentially about ideas. Not about me, some old ideas, perhaps some new ideas and certainly some new packaged ideas. I have tried to cull ideas from decades of life experience and incorporate them into an original Ratatouille made for perhaps the very first time with an added special ingredient. I hope you like Ratatouille. 
If I were a man, by the way, I would have used a sports, not a cooking metaphor. Ideally, the thoughts presented here can stimulate introspection and personal growth, no matter where you are along the careers at work. The ideas are wide-ranging, from style to stress and even etiquette, reflecting that a life in business is holistic and about pleasures more than pain. This book is not a textbook. You will not learn the five keys to running a better meeting or the six essentials for dealing with difficult colleagues. It contains strategic ideas, values, experiences, lessons learned, stories, essays, and morsels of advice. This book is about helping women and a few men to grow the knowledge, know-how, and tools for empowerment and balance in today's business world. Allonge. 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 This was a second book reading from The Ordinary Sound. I remember reading this book in my early 20s just as I was graduating university and getting ready for the workplace, provided an insight into the sometimes cutthroat business world that existed out there. And as a young woman getting ready to go out there into the real world, it was somewhat comforting. A couple of things prepared before I left. The book is filled with lively lessons, stories, helpful hints and and she teaches every reader how to identify her own passions and talents improve her communication skills balance work and life and cope with everyday stress thank you like and subscribe if you would like to hear more in the first chapter of 100 books that i own in my home and just comment down below if you have any recommendations or any books you would like me to read.